Hello and welcome to another edition of the President's and Prime Minister's podcast. I'm Ian Dale. Well, today we're going to talk about, I think, one of the most interesting American presidents in recent history, at any rate. It's Lyndon Baines Johnson and George Osborne, the former Chancellor of the Exchequer. He wrote the chapter in the book, The President's, and he's here to talk about LBJ. Now, you have had a long-standing interest in LBJ, haven't you? Why the fascination? Well, first of all, Thanks for asking me to write uh, the chapter, which I did in, lock- in lockdown. It was one of, my, one of my lockdown projects. Uh, which well, I- it was either you or William Hague, and I came to you first, <laughs> and he was going to be second, because I know he's equally fascinated by it. Well, any time William Hague's your reserve is a, <laughs> <laughs> it's a good sign. Um, he's an interesting president for someone like me to be fascinated with. I mean, primarily because, of course, he's from the sort of liberal US tradition and the Conservatives as a conservative, and always more traditionally associated with Republicans. But I've always had a great interest in him, as have others like William Hague and Gordon Brown and Michael Howard, sort of political contemporaries of mine, because he, I think he poses the kind of central political question, which is when do the ends justify the means, uh, which is so often the case in, in politics, either in the most extreme examples of wars and invasions and so on, or in the case of kind of rough and tumble political tactics to get the job done. And Lyndon Johnson is the extreme example of that in the kind of American political sphere because he's sort of gross in his tactics mm. and verging, we would now say, corrupt. Uh, and, 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 you know, he's sort of completely Machiavellian. And yet his presidency has these landmark achievements domestically uh, on civil rights. You know, he's the president who gives... Uh, he ex- extends voting in, in, in to southern USA to American blacks. He introduces Medicare, Medicaid, the great public health programs that exist in America today. He extends federal support for education in America. So he achieves things which all subsequent Democrat presidents have kind of tried to emulate, including Joe Biden. Uh, and yet he does it in the most kind of horrendous way and so you're forced to kind of ask ask yourself that question when do the ends justify the means and i think in his case domestically they do i say domestically because the other thing that hugely overshadows the johnson presidency is the vietnam war which basically breaks him and, Mm. and arguably kind of breaks america and i think in an age you know we had doing this podcast with the you know horrific invasion of ukraine underway um, you know, I've been in government when we face these questions about intervening in Libya, not intervening in Syria. Uh, I was a member of parliament when, when we voted on the Iraq war as an opposition MP. You know, these, these questions of when do you intervene to defend what you think of as your interests and your values, uh, you know, are the same questions that confronted the Johnson presidency. And we all now say, well, obviously, Vietnam was a, a tragedy. But at the time, they thought they were standing up to communist Russia yeah. and communist China, and they were trying to learn the lessons of Munich. And so, so I think his presidency throws up all of these kind of eternal questions, if you like, uh, in in politics. And you hosted a dinner in Downing Street, didn't you, for Robert Caro, who's who's written these marvellous biographies, which I have to say, I've got them on my shelves. And I've always thought, <laughs> I'm not going to start them now. I'm going to wait till I retire, but um, I, I hope I don't die before I get to read them, because they are, by all accounts, just the most brilliant books. Mm. So Robert Caro, who's very, very much still with us and still completing his, his, well, biography, his biography of <laughs> Lyndon Johnson, um, has written a kind of really used... Johnson as a way of writing a story of post-war America. And, you know, each volume is you know, many hundreds of pages long, goes into incredible detail of some aspect of Johnson's life. Uh, so he is the kind of greatest biographer of our age. Um, and uh, I, you know, I had the opportunity of him coming to Britain. I said, like, I'll, I'll throw a dinner for you in, in the number 11 dining room, which is a very beautiful room designed by John Soane. And you wouldn't believe, you know, people from the Labour Party, the Liberal Democrats, the Conservatives, they're all like trying to angle for an invite because there weren't that many seats around the table. And we had an absolutely brilliant, uh, you know, brilliant evening. Um, and he he's interesting because he's also written a book about the person who sort of built the transport system in New York, which sounds very boring, <laughs> but it's actually a great book as well, 
about someone called Robert Moses, and there's about to be a play in London about his life. And again, it's this question of what, what you know, what to get the job done, you know, in politics to create a public health care system, to create a you know an urban transport system for New York. What are you prepared to do? And if you only play by the rules, if you're Mister Nicey Nicey. You, you, you often don't succeed, um, and I, you know, I think uh, you know one thing I learned from my time in politics. I spent half my time as, as an MP in, in opposition, half my time in government, <clears throat> and you know it's really delivering, actually getting things to happen rather than talking about them is the is the mm. big challenge in a democracy, and and it's so easy to kind of write your pamphlet saying this is what the education system should look like. The kind of the thing I found fascinating, although lots of people say it's kind of mind-numbingly boring and it's bureaucracy and it's the blob, but the kind of getting actually delivering is is to my mind the great kind of Rubik's you, cube you have to solve, and, and Johnson solves it. With the size of government now, it doesn't really matter whether mm. it's America or here. The size of government, it's much more difficult to pull the levers and get things done than it would have been in the 1960s, either there or here. Well, Johnson is creating the modern federal U.S. government. I mean, he, you know, before him, there's not really any public, federal public support for healthcare or education. Uh, and, and, you know, the criticism levelled at the Johnson period uh, is that it, it sort of sets up a culture of welfare dependency and sort of entraps poor America in these great entitlement programmes. And that's the kind of criticism that comes 20, 30 years later in the 1980s and the 1990s. Um, it, I think at the time, however, as you say, he's building on nothing. And he himself, by the way, with the possible exception of Abraham Lincoln, comes from the second, is the poorest person ever to be the president. Mm. He grows up in absolute poverty in, in, in um, the hill country of Texas, near Austin, uh, you know, where, where there's nothing. There, are no, there aren't paved roads, there's no electricity. Without electricity, you know, people have to do back-breaking work all day, both in the home and in the fields. Um, and he, he, I think it's hard, you have to be a pretty harsh person to say, OK, well, it all, you know, this was a t terrible expansion of the American state. The truth is he gives the American state a bit of a heart in the 1960s, just as, a, by the way, it begin to afford it, because it's become the world's richest country by then, uh, very clearly. Um, and I think, you know, in a very, in a mature democracy like Britain, if you come in, let's take the NHS, which is you know, always a very contentious issue. If you come in, the NHS has been around for 70 odd years. Uh, it's got over a million people working in it. And you've got 60 odd million people who depend on it. And you're the health secretary. It, it's not enough to say, I've got my three point for a plan to replace the NHS or mm. you've got to fight for, if you want to make radical change, you, there's, there is resistance in the system. Some of it is, uh, you know, very, um, you know, consumer, uh, sorry, producer interest based and, you know, it's, it's, it's very obstructive. If your plan's good enough, you'll get past that. But if you just throw up your hand and say, oh, I can't deal with this bureaucracy, then I'm afraid you're in the wrong business. You should go and, <laughs> you know, go and write a newspaper column. I've done that as well. That's quite easy <laughs> compared to actually delivering the kind of change. Yeah. And Johnson uses all these methods having been an, a great senator and a congressman before that, to do things like the, you know, no civil rights legislation has passed the US Senate since the US Civil War, uh, despite all the promises of Abraham Lincoln. No legislation has passed till Johnson is Senate Majority Leader. Mm. He's the person who gets two landmark civil rights acts through the, you know, the, the, um, the um, filibusters in the Senate and gets them onto the statute books. People can talk about it. Look at all the problems Biden's having, kind of getting some of his domestic legislation onto the statute book. Look at Obama's presidency, let alone Trump's. I mean, you know, it's very hard to get things done. And Johnson, by essentially kind of, you know, he has this great aphorism, which you first rule politics, you've got to learn to count. And he goes through every senator, he works out what every senator wants, maybe completely unconnected with the legislation he's trying to pass, and he kind of ticks them all off, he cajoles them, he bullies them, he threatens them, he flatters them, whatever it takes. And he kind of, it's a bit like anyone who's a fan of the West Wing, he is the guy 
who counts the vo- yeah. ticks the votes off on the equivalent of the whiteboard back then. Um, and um, and that to me is you know a lesson in it's as I say it's not enough to talk about something delivering it is a whole order of different uh, magnitude more difficult. You, you mentioned his childhood. Let's go into that in a little bit more detail because in essence, from from reading your essay, that really influences his later life and sort of his his desire to introduce these really massive reforms so that people in those those kind of areas didn't experience the poverty that he did. Yeah, he he grows up in one of the most isolated communities in in early 20th century America, which is very very poor kind of hard scrub farming in in Texas. And he's got absolutely nothing in his life that would suggest he is destined for greatness. And yet, almost from the moment he can speak, he's like, I'm going to be the president. <laughs> mm. And he, he goes to, you know, rural schools no one's ever heard of. He goes to a southwest Texas teacher's college for his education. This is not Harvard or Yale or West Point, you know, where the people like the Kennedys have been. And and it's what's odd about his life is he's incredibly arrogant and presumptuous that he is destined to be in charge. And and it and it really rubs up all his contemporaries when he's whether he's a college student or he's at school or yet when he becomes a kind of junior congressional aide and then everyone you know he, he definitely puts people's backs up. And yet. There's also a side to him, which he doesn't kind of seem to wear on his sleeve much, which is deeply and passionately on the side of the poorest Americans, including black Americans, which, of course, is very unusual for a white poor American of his background. And he, you know, right, that's his mission. And when he's the congressman for the area he grew up in, he's the person who delivers the electricity. By the way, in some corrupt deal which he benefits from, so that's a kind of classic question of ends and means, but what does he do? He gets the electricity to the area which otherwise wouldn't have got it. Uh, and then, you know, as president, uh, he's, he's always um, got those people in mind. And, and that's kind of quite remarkable, and it does seem to be genuine. And he also has, a, you know, when he passes the civil rights legislation, you know, he stands up in Congress as president addressing both houses of Congress after the after Martin Luther King has faced and his demonstrators have faced uh, violence in Selma, Alabama, and he says, we shall overcome. He's like the American president who, the white American president who uses the words of the great, um, you know, civil rights anthem. And, and, you know, there's an enormous applause in Congress and it unlocks years of opposition to civil rights voting legislation, which is going to change the politics and power structures in the South. So that's a kind of another paradox of his life, the kind of arrogance and the swagger, whilst at the same time, the apparent lack of any kind of racism, which would have been you know, expected of someone of his background. And without ever, and although he ends up making many, many millions of pounds, dollars, in his various sort of corrupt dealings out of television stations and a company that called Brown and Root, which eventually ends up as Halliburton, he, you know, he, he's still sort of fighting for the, for the poor guy, um, and that and that that's remarkable too. How did he first become a congressman? Well, he he sets off. He's on on course to. Well, he's he actually spent some time with his parents who are in despair, working on a road on a rock breaking gang building dirt roads through Texas you know again you know it's an extraordinary background for someone who ultimately becomes president <coughs> he 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 trains he goes to a teachers college in all of these places by the way he becomes like head of the students or head of them you know he he he's kind of already maneuvering for position uh he takes a year off when he runs out of money to teach in a very very poor mexican american teaching uh, school on the mexican border um then he basically gets a job as a sort of uh, he gets a job as a teacher, but at that crucial moment, um, the, a congressman offers him a job as a secretary to to him as you know a kind of congressional aide, basically a junior congressional aide, and he heads to Washington. First time he's left Texas, first time he's you know, and that is the beginning of his journey. And there's that great there's a great sort of story about him. He arrives, 
in those days, these congressional aides were all put up in a kind of hostel, a big hostel. And he knows that we're communal bathrooms. He, you know, he knows no one in Washington at all. And he, you know, the first night he's there, he takes four separate showers. <laughs> Why? Because every time he has a shower, he meets some other man in the... <laughs> in the changing room who you can talk to, some other new kid who's turned up. He brushes his teeth five times, separate times, because he wants an excuse to stand next to someone at the sinks and, and, and get to talk to him. So he's a kind of amazing hustler. But his energy, I think another thing about him, which, which you know, he, his unbelievable sort of appetite for work, his, he worked all hours in every job he did, including the president, um, you know, no one works harder than him. And then from being a congressional aide, he, he gets to run one of Franklin Roosevelt's uh, New Deal programs in Texas. He becomes then the congressman. And from then he's on his way up and he, he wins in 1948 the most corrupt, closest Senate race, I think still in American history, um, when he beats the kind of favorite uh, who's a self-styled cowboy called Coke Stevenson. He beats him by around 87 votes or something in the 1948 Texas Senate race, using essentially votes rigging, you know, the ballot stuffing from these sort of bosses, these sort of agricultural bosses who controlled the Mexican workforces near the border in Texas. And, you know, he just makes sure that he doesn't close his ballot boxes until the other guys closed all his. Um, this is something that people in this country can't really get their heads around, can they? And it's not, yeah. It's, it is, I would say it's endemic in American politics still, but that's why there were so many suspicions, in a way, about the last election. Yes, I mean, voting reform and voting and the kind of accuracy of elections is still a contentious issue in America. It was fairly normal, amazingly, in, um, in US races in the 60s and 70s, you know, the, for that kind of thing to happen. I mean, John F. Kennedy narrowly beats... Um, Richard Nixon yeah. uh, in the 1960 US presidential race. By the way, a race that Johnson wanted to be the um, presidential candidate, ends up as the vice presidential candidate. And, you know, it is widely thought that the Kennedy family kept the voting booths in the south side of Chicago, the poor area of Chicago, open until they were had enough votes to just beat Nixon in that race. Uh, mm. And, you know, that was... So, you know, Johnson is certainly not the only person engaging uh, in this. Uh, but, it, but it, you know, it's an amazingly... One of, if you want to read a fantastic chapter of, of Robert Caro's book, you know, read the 1948 Texas Senate race. I mean, it puts any British by-election or whatever <laughs> to absolute shame in terms of... If you think, if you Even think Tower Hamlets. It's, <laughs> anything that happens in Britain, you go like, my God, it's on a mass, it's totally different scale in America. Um, you tell a wonderful anecdote about FDR almost predicting that Lyndon Johnson would be president. Well, Johnson is a, you know, he's a sort of liberal nationalist. You know, he's a believer in the strength of the United States, but he's a believer that the United States will only be strong if it looks after its poorest. And his great hero is FDR, <clears throat> the New Dealer from the 1930s. <clears throat> and he he's there in the crowds when FDR's inaugurated and does that great, you know, anything we have to fear is fear itself, inauguration speech. And then he, when Roosevelt, when he's become a new member of Congress, Roosevelt does a kind of train ride through Texas and Johnson joins him. And uh, FDR tells his aides afterwards that boy's going to be president. And the interesting thing about that prediction is that no one from the South has been president since the Civil War. Mm. And it was seen as basically impossible for a Southerner to become the president. And one of Johnson's great achievements uh, is he is the first Southerner to become the president. And albeit, of course through an assassination of Kennedy. But nevertheless, he's the first president to come from, from the South. And he kind of opens the door to subsequent Southern presidents, Jimmy Carter, uh, Bill Clinton, George Bush one and two. You know, they're Southern presidents. But until Johnson, there hadn't been one. And he kind of knows he has to pass. And, you know, in those days, of course, the Democrat Party were the party of the South. And the, uh, and the party of essentially a kind of racist bloc in the Senate that had stopped any Senate legislation. Abraham Lincoln had been a Republican, and the Republicans were the party mm. of the North, and the party that black Americans voted for. 
And Johnson does this trade, probably to become president. He never quite puts it like this, but he basically trades the South, the white South, for the presidency. He knows that if he, he's got to show, he shows this as a senator first, that he can deliver civil rights, that he's not a creature of the sort of Southern Democratic white caucus. And and it's interesting, and it, when he subsequently, I'm jumping ahead a bit here, but he gets re-elected with the biggest percentage vote of any American president in history. And the only states he loses are the Southern ones. It's the first time they haven't voted Democrat, they vote Republican. It's a presage of everything that was to mm. subsequently come in American politics under Reagan and you know, ultimately Donald Trump. But, um, he, he, that achievement of becoming the Southern president, I think kind of opens the door to what we would now call the New South. Austin, where he's the, originally the congressman near where he grows up, is the great booming city of America today. You know, and, and he, he's the person who sort of brings the South into mainstream American politics. We'll come on to his Senate career in a moment, but um, what did he do during the war? Because again, you've got... I mean, it, it, it's actually almost emblematic of his whole life, what, what he did during the war, I think. Well, he, he, he so he's a congressman by this point. Uh, and some, let's be clear, some congressmen have resigned from the Congress or taken a leave of absence mm. and gone to fight in uniform for the United States in the Second World War. He doesn't do that. But he's very conscious that he, he needs, a, you know, if he wants to be the president, he's going to need a war career. And so he arranges uh, essentially a, vi a sort of fact-finding mission to, um, the, to, to the South Pacific or, the, or Southeast Asia, where America is fighting Japan. <clears throat> and he gets himself um, a, essentially a seat on a bombing raid over New Guinea. And it, were, you know, it was one flight in a plane. And given what he was subsequently described about his war, you would think the guy had been fighting for years and years in the Second World War, flying in planes. This was literally, he just went on one plane once. But the plane was shot at a lot. Other planes, part of the, the bombing mission, were uh, shot down. His engine was shot. One of his engines was shot. So, and, you know, and he, he got, he, but he managed to get himself awarded um, an American decoration, the Silver Star. So he forever after, he was like the war hero, Lyndon Johnson. And, it, yeah, it's... But, but it, it, I think it, it's too much to say... It was a complete fake because his life was, albeit not for that long, in danger. Mm. Um, now, you mentioned the 1948 Senate election, which he won by 87 votes. Within six years, he was majority leader. How did he achieve that? Well, that's an amazing thing because the Senate until that point had been entirely based on seniority, i.e. the longer you served the more senior you got, and only the eldest senators, or the, well, the ones who have been there longest, <clears throat> got to be chairs of the committees. And he takes a position that he, he goes after the majority leadership position. Um, you know, so this is for those who kind of follow, um, you know, um, modern politics. This is the kind of Mitch McConnell, Harry Reid position. Yeah, very powerful. It wasn't powerful when he got the job. He... It was actually seen as a bit of a non-job because the real power lay with the individual committees, foreign affairs, appropriations, and so on. <clears throat> so he takes what's a, a bit of a, you know, f has the potential to be a powerful job, but is not an important job, persuades essentially a bunch of Southern Democrat senators who he was ultimately later to turn on, on civil rights, he was later to sell them out, but... To get where he was, he to get where he needed to be, he sort of sucked up to them, um, and he um, he gets himself put in this position as Senate Majority Leader and transforms the post into the absolute centre of power in the in the Senate, um, and you know he, he, he I mean, there's a good case. I mean, I, you asked me to write a book, uh, you know, about him as the president, but you could definitely write a whole chapter about him as the senator. Mm. And he, you know, is probably the most powerful senator ever in the history of the United States. You know, and uh, so he and he does that by, you know, basically working out all the tools you can use to get senators to vote for things, whether they have a nice office, whether they go on a foreign assignment, the foreign trip they want to go on, 
you know, he persuades. There's a whole set of um, senators in the in the in the in the kind of rocky state, uh, rocky mountain states like Colorado, who want uh, dams built, and he, you know, he he trades kind of building dams there for their support on civil rights legislation. You know, he he's just incredibly capable, and and at essentially working out what each senator needs to get each senator over the line. What's what's the you know, what, what do you need to give them? And again, to this day, he's held up as an example of a time when you could make bipartisan politics work in America, you could work with the opposite party. And he must have done that because, of course, as a Republican president, uh, Eisenhower, um, and the amount of legislation that was passed mm. in, in those years, there must have been cooperation along those lines. Yes, and I think he... Yeah, very much so, and he... Um, he, I, you know, I guess I come back to where I started the podcast. He's, you know, all of this manoeuvring and these tactics. And, you know, he would invite people. By this point, he had a ranch down in Texas. He's very tall, by the way. He's like six foot six, I think he is. And so he's a tall guy. And he would get senators down to stay. And then he would um, kind of get them in the swimming pool and get them basically basically into the deep end where he could stand and they couldn't. And, and physically, he's a big, big... He's not just that he's six foot tall, he's kind of big, gangly arms and big jug ears. And he, he sort of stands between them and the shallow end until they could agree on... The, he's Did really, you ever adopt any such tactics yourself, George? Was, <laughs> that, I, I mean, that whole kind of... Um, for people who love the kind of, um, you know, the... I mean, politics isn't so much like that this anymore. But the kind of the the people, the 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 people handling the vote grabbing in the parliament. The, although what we'd say here in Britain, I mean, I, uh, the whips, you know, that that bit of politics. I've just got this vision of you and Andrew Bridgen in a swimming pool now. <laughs> well, I was a junior whip. That was my first uh, job in politics, which I loved, and uh, I did a fair bit of cajoling myself. I'm not quite like on Johnson. So. <laughs> There's another great story about him, which actually I don't put in the chapter. Which is, he he proposes. He, he subsequently um, married someone who was to be with him throughout his life, Lady Bird Johnson, who who you know and actually died not that long ago. Um, but um, the first girl he proposes to says no to him, or her father says no to him because the father says that Johnson boy is never going to amount to anything, and so she turns him down. And thereafter, when he was president, his presidential helicopter would, would fly him to his ranch. But he would, instead of landing at the ranch, he'd always get the helicopter to land in the back garden of this girl's house where she was married to some other local boy. And so the whole house would shake with the with Marine One landing just to remind her that, yes, this Johnson did amount to something. Um... What was his relationship like with Kennedy? Because um, you've got this wonderful quote here. Um, this was before, I think, the run in 1960, when he was beaten by what he called a little scrawny fellow with rickets. Now, I don't I have no idea whether Kennedy knew that he'd said that or not, but if he had, it's quite difficult to recover that relationship, I would have thought. Well, Kennedy was very much his junior. You know, he was the junior senator from Massachusetts and, and Lyndon Johnson was Senate Majority Leader, so they knew each other very well. Mm. <clears throat> and I think Johnson just couldn't quite believe in the primaries that, you know, this much more junior, younger character, who he would say lacked depth and substance or whatever beat him for uh, essentially because he was more telegenic and more user friendly than John and Johnson's political style belonged to an age not the television age and Johnson's I guess the first great kind of television president uh, sorry Kennedy's the first great television president I have a kind of theory uh, so Gordon Brown loves the Robert Caro biographies of Lyndon Johnson and w once wrote a book review about it when he was Johnson's exchequer I can't help but think that, you know, he was beat to the late body nomination by young Tony Blair, the whip, telegenic whippersnapper. I'm, I think there's a bit of the Gordon Brown, which will be like... He didn't put that in the review. I didn't put that in the book review, because I can't... <laughs> book review is impeccably sourced. This is just... Uh, this is a George Osborne theory, uh, having, but if uh, it, having shadowed uh, Gordon Brown for many years when I was shadowed. Actually, if you go through 
political history in different countries. That there, there are often <coughs> circumstances yes. like that. I mean, um, David Davis, David Cameron, you could almost put like that. Different generations, one more telegenic than the other, um, accused of not having the depth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There are all sorts of parallels that you can draw, aren't there? Yeah, so he... Um yeah, it's, it's a kind of classic situation. The older kind of insider beaten yeah. by the younger telegenic outsider. Uh, anyway, Kennedy wins. And then interestingly, although it's, it's kind of quite debated in the Kennedy camp, including with his brother, who was to emerge as Johnson's great mm. enemy, Robert Kennedy, uh, you know, they, they basically put him on the ticket as vice president. And why did he accept it though? Well, the, so they offer it because he can deliver Texas, they think, and they need you know, it's going to be a tight presidential race as we were just yeah. discussing against Nixon. Um, but um, why does Johnson accept it? Well, the, this is the kind of fascinating um thing, and no one can understand because he's trading Senate major the most powerful senator in American history, Senate majority leader, a total lock on everything that happens at the federal government level for vice president, which is famously a job with no power. Um, and his reasoning is really straightforward. He says, well, I've done my maths. One in five vice presidents become president because the president dies. <laughs> this is not like becomes like, you know, like Joe Biden was vice president, but then got himself elected president. This is like they die, uh, the president and the vice president takes over. And he does the maths and he says one in five is not a bad odds to become president. And he, by that point, there's no, he doesn't really have another route to become president because he's so sort of badly beaten in the primaries and Kennedy's going to be there for eight years, he thinks. Um, and he hates his time as vice president and he's miserable. He tries, you know, there are various things he tries to get off the ground. Um, but, uh, I mean, interesting, by the way, in all this, he's the guy who creates NASA. This is an interesting little footnote to Johnson's... Uh, life that's as a senator then as vice president he builds up nasa but he um which is why it's in houston <laughs> uh but um he uh yeah he he basically hates being vice president and it looks like the kennedys are going to drop him from the 1964 re-election ticket until kennedy is assassinated in dallas how, how realistic do you think that was because that did happen a few times in the 19th century but in modern american politics it i mean even dan quayle survived it, it hasn't really happened there but was a there's scandal always speculation. In Dolph, i mean i didn't go into this so much in it's in your chapter but he, he johnson's actually on the verge of being engulfed in a in a corruption scandal as vice president so it's quite plausible that that might have made him too damaging to take up. And yeah, actually, in the subsequent decade, um, there are... The, Agnew has to resign mm, as president. That's true. President, so. so, 22nd of November, 1963. Um, just take us through the events of that day. Well, the, yeah, I, I guess you start with Johnson becomes president as a result of what I describe in the book as the most infamous murder in history. And I remember writing his words and thinking, well, maybe there's Julius Caesar... But, you know, Kennedy's assassination is something we've yeah. all seen the pictures of. He, you know, it's in Texas. Uh, it's in his home, in Johnson's home territory. Johnson's in one of the cars behind. Uh, Kennedy is assassinated. Um, and and others are hit, like the governor of Texas at the time is also shot. So, the you know, the, what Johnson's, Johnson's account of it is fascinating. He's basically pressed to the floor by the Secret Service agent. The, the car speeds to the hospital and uh, Parkland Hospital where him and his wife, you know, wait. You know, they're sort of put in a side room and they wait for a couple of hours and then eventually one of, one of Kennedy's aides comes and tells him that uh, the, the president is dead. Um, and then there's a kind of a... You know, he's then... If, if you think of, I, 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 I write about this a bit in the book. If you think about what we think of as how a president becomes president, yeah. the inauguration, the bands, you know, uh, you know, uh, Beyonce singing <laughs> on the Capitol Hill, you know, all of that. And it's so choreographed and the oath, of, you know, Johnson becomes president sitting on in Air Force One, which is much smaller in those days than the current Air Force One with Kennedy's body in a coffin next to him, uh, with, um, uh, you know, um, 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 Kennedy's wife, Jackie, Jackie, 
literally covered in blood. With him, get they got a local judge to turn up with a Bible, and he's he's he takes the oath of office. In this, in their plane is unbelievably hot because they haven't turned the air conditioning on yet to take off, and it, you know, it's such a sort of stag. And by the way, this is in a country. This is in the early 1960s. This is the time of, you know, the Bay of um, Bay of Pigs, the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Berlin Wall. This is a country deep in the middle of a deeply cold, cold war, with the whole world watching, with no one knowing whether the assassination had been organ, organ you know, organized by the Soviet Union. People, you know, nuclear forces on alert. And in that situation, he right from the word go right from the first minute is is not overawed by his responsibilities he takes control you know he he exudes authority control calmness there are all these people coming at him with different questions and you know re false reports and speculation about them the, the assassination and he's just absolutely in charge from the so, moment he's on so he's the very opposite of Kiefer Sutherland and <laughs> designated survivor <laughs> he's, he's very opposite he's, he's just you know lots of people freeze in those situations yeah. um at, you know at every level of authority he's the opposite and and I think a kind of overlooked part of the Johnson legacy is that he handles that he kind of reassures America, he reassures the world, he stands down the kind of escalating nuclear um, escalation that's potential, that is about to, to happen with the Soviet Union. He, you know, he, and he helps the nation mourn. And he gives a speech five days later to Congress, uh, which kind of catches the national mood. I think because people think of Kennedy as the great communicator, they think of and everything I've been saying about Johnson as the backroom dealer. They do, for, you know, I'm, I, I you know, I, I've forgotten this podcast also. There are moments, like with his civil rights speech, we shall overcome, like mm. with his speech to Congress after the Kennedy assassination, when he does catch the national mood. Um, and I tell a good story in the book about meeting Lucy Baines Johnson. I met Lucy Baines Johnson, his daughter. You know, she's at school in Washington and suddenly it was all obviously decades before iPhones and <clears throat> the internet and kind of word goes round the kind of Catholic, the, the cathedral, not Catholic, sorry, the National Cathedral Girls' School in Washington that something's happened but they don't know what. And then they're all kind of assembled. And they're all taken into the assembly. She told this story to me. And they're told that John F. Kennedy has been assassinated. And they're all in shock and they're in tears. And she's in shock and tears. And she doesn't, she doesn't work out what it means until two Secret Service agents walk into the hall in front of all the other girls. So she, she said the first thing was like she was so embarrassed. <laughs> As you would be as a school kid, and and she's let out because yeah. she's now the daughter of the president, and they want to protect her. So it's an amazing, uh, you know, you could well there are there have been films made about it, uh, and books written, and it, just those sort of four or five days of American politics when they deal with the assassination, and and sort of basically stabilize things. And he, you know, what's interesting is he. Um, I can think of some recent examples in British politics where people are elected as continuity candidates, but think they're change candidates, and that's a mistake. And he understands that he, he he's an inheritor of the He hasn't got the mandate in his own right. He's taken over because his predecessor has you know, died. And he takes on the kind of Kennedy, he says, for Kennedy's sake, let's pass civil rights, let's start the war on poverty that um, Kennedy had promised, let's deliver a tax cut, which Kennedy had talked about. In other words, he kind of adopts the Kennedy agenda. And that gets him through to the re-election um, about a year later. And how, how much did that change then? I mean, the, the, the 64, or 65 to 69 period, was that pure Johnson? That's or pure was Johnson. That, that So there wasn't any Kennedy overhang there? Well, the big overhang is Vietnam. Yeah. So the when Johnson gets re-elected, as I say, he gets... 61% of the vote, no one's ever done that before. All since. He he then launched. How much was that him and how much was it his can, the candidate opposite well, in Goldwater? It always helps to be running against someone useless as uh, 
as the uh, Tories who faced uh, Jeremy Corbyn into elections will tell you. But it you know, Gold, Goldwater was actually a prototype of the changes coming to the Republican Party. He's a kind of libertarian senator from Arizona. And the Democrats run, if anyone's ever seen that famous ad of mm. the girl picking daisy, uh, petals yeah. off a daisy, uh, and, and it turns into the sort of countdown to a nuclear attack. They're basically the Democrats saying, this guy, Goldwater's a crazy who's going to you know, put us into a nuclear war. Um, so that definitely helps. But Johnson is very popular, and he's he's achieved real things in the year he's been president. He's passed a, one of the civil rights uh, laws on, on segregation in schools and in public spaces. Um, so he has, you know, there are solid achievements even in that first year as president. When he's re-elected as president, he then embarks on, a, on, on, a, on this what's called the Great Society Programme, um, which is the Medicare, Medicaid, public education, and all sorts of other things now which we would take for granted, but like food, federal food safety laws, like the FDA, Food and Drug Administration, federal road safety rules around car designs and seatbelts and stuff like that. So it's, you know, it, it's a kind of big progressive era. Of course, it's a progressive era in other, you know, it's this is also, if you think of Britain in the late 60s, this is when a lot of the you know, legalization of homosexuality, end of the oh. death penalty, um, you know, the legalization of divorce. abortion, you know, divorce, the sort of Roy Jenkins era. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's, I wouldn't say that the Johnson regime is unique in the world in this period, but, um, but, but you know, it, it's, it's never as striking what he achieves. And particularly when you've got the Vietnam War <laughs> hanging over everything, because it's, if, you, if we take a modern day example, I mean, COVID seems to have, effectively stalled any reform agenda that our current government has and yet it the vietnam war didn't stop the reform agenda that johnson had well it does in the end actually i would disagree with you i think in the end vietnam becomes so all-consuming and expensive that mm. johnson runs out of money and political capital real capital and political capital to do his domestic program. Um, and there's another interesting, and, th and th uh, that quite often happens in America with conflicts that it kind of, you know, the Second World War kind of killed off the New Deal, ultimately. Um, I think the, what, he, Johnson inherits from Kennedy a presence in South Vietnam, 16,000 advisors, and he decides to reappoint, the one area where he has no, not much expertise is foreign affairs. He hires this kind of stellar team, Johnson's, uh, Kennedy's stellar national security team, Bob McNamara, McGeorge Bundy, Dean Rusk. These are like the best and the brightest. And, you know, they, and, and, it's, and there's a kind of rapid escalation of the Vietnam War in those first couple of years of his re-election. Um, and suddenly, within two years of him being re-elected as president, you have hundreds of thousands of American soldiers in Vietnam in combat operations and America doubling down to try and win. And it, it destroy, you know, tears apart the Democrat Party, um, much like, you know, Iraq tore apart the British Labour Party. It, um, as I say, exhausts the administration. It makes Johnson so unpopular he can't actually visit most places, he, he ends up, his, his visits are to go to military bases. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's an interesting, uh, since we um, we focused on the Queen recently here in Britain, uh, you know, he, she, he's the only president the Queen has didn't meet. Uh, and that's because he can't really, tra you know, he can't come. Britain has taken what I think is an understudied decision not to join the Vietnam War, even though Australia and other American allies did. And, you know, he doesn't come to Britain. Um, but it it become it, it's an absolute sort of textbook case in how you can get deeper and deeper into a conflict, and for everyone who thinks oh we've learned the lessons and we would never repeat such a thing, and yet it, I you know these these really hard dilemmas. Okay, you want to stand up to Russian aggression, but you're not prepared to get involved selling soldiers into the Ukraine. You know, you talk about containing China's ambitions. Well, are you going to put soldiers into Vietnam? Are you, you know, Johnson's facing quite similar questions to the kind of questions we would face about 
aggression from a from a you know mm. what, what they would regard as an enemy and and it, and once you're in the conflict all the dynamics play out so first of all they misunderstand what the conflict you know they think it's a war, an ideological war against communism on behalf of the free world they've they've made the mistake of um of you know as they see it in a previous generation of losing communist china uh china to the communists which uh, you know, a generation of American politicians were held to account for. They think of Munich and not standing up to Hitler. Mm. So, so they think of it as a kind of stand up against the, the dictator. But of course, in Vietnam, it's seen as a nationalist struggle against kind of colonial forces, first French, then American. He gets terrible information from the military, which uh, again doesn't particularly surprise me, of, you know, keep being told you know, we're on the verge of winning mr president don't quit now a few more troops you know and um and uh, you know the british military which i work with and they are brilliant and amazing but and they're very good at telling you for a prime minister don't get into a war but once you're in a war they, they understand and we want to get the job done and so they're often the last people to say actually we've lost was there any moment in his presidency where he seriously considered withdrawing? Well, he um, he is told to withdraw by his vice president, Hubert Humphrey, and then in a really dramatic moment by Bob McNamara, who's the defence secretary, who's come in from, he'd been CEO of Ford Motor Company and he'd brought kind of modern management techniques to mm. the Department of Defence. In 1967, McNamara says, we've lost and we've got to get out. Johnson, you know, there's a kind of extraordinary moment, which I detail in the chapter, where some reporter says to him, uh, you know, what, what, you know, what's at stake in this war, war Mr. President? Why are you, why are you absolutely sick of it? And he literally gets out his penis and puts it on the table and says, that's what's at stake. <laughs> it's an unbelievable story, but it's true. And, um, you know, so in fact, Johnson, he's, he goes around saying, I'm not going to be the first American president who loses a war. And you also get this other dynamic, which, you know, very sadly I saw, in Afghanistan and Iraq, where once soldiers start losing their lives and you get injured veterans coming back, you go, well, we, what about for their sake we can't give up, mm. you know? And so he's sort of stuck in this, and he becomes increasingly paranoid. The guy who had been so calm at the time of the Kennedy assassination starts to believe that kind of communists have infiltrated student campuses and he has the FBI and the CIA spying on all his political opponents and spying on student groups in America. You know, the whole, I mean, if you think of where it ends up and, you know, people who know something about America will know that by the late 1960s, you know, the country is deeply divided. There have been race riots in the cities. The college campuses are, uh, you know, are um, uh, deeply radicalised. You end up with tragedies like Kent State where the US soldiers killed students. And, they, and, then, and then, although this is after Johnson's decided not to rerun, the 1968 Democrat convention takes place in, essentially in the middle of a riot uh, yeah. in, in Chicago. So, uh, you know, there, it, 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 by the end, Vietnam has consumed everything. And Nixon, ironically, is elected to bring the peace and end the war. How did it get to the point where he said on the 31st of March 1968, I will not seek and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president? Was it just Vietnam or was it wider than that? Well, it's a, it's a big decision not to seek re-election. I mean, I don't, I'm don't. i trying to think, but in my lifetime, I don't think an American, uh, I don't think an American president no. has not sought re-election when they've had the opportunity. <clears throat> um, and he'd only served a year as... After, being, after Kennedy's assassination, so he could have served a full second term. He he backs off, I think, for three reasons. So one is he doesn't he's not sure he can win, crucially. Um, second, he is begins to be worried about his health. His doctor started to tell him that he's not well, and he was actually to die four years later. And then crucially, he's going to fight Bobby Kennedy for the nomination, and Bobby Kennedy's coming after him. At, there's a tragedy there because. Bobby Kennedy is himself assassinated after the California primary in that co in that contest, but mm. but by that point Johnson's decided to quit. I think he makes the one mis big miscalculation he makes is he thinks it'll be easier to deliver peace in Vietnam in the period where he's still president, but he's not running for re-election. But he had another great saying, which is power is where power goes, and the moment he's not running for re-election, all the power 
yeah. disappears. You know, um, as some British prime ministers will tell you, once you tell everyone you're going to quit, you're can't think who you're referring to. I can actually there've been two in my in <laughs> two recently, uh, and um, you know the authority starts to drain away, and um, Johnson finds that, and he can't deliver the piece, and North Vietnam says. Well, this guy's not going to be around. Yeah. And so one of the sort of tragedies, personal tragedy for Johnson, is they do the deal with Nixon. Uh, just like, in fact, if you remember the Iranians and the host, you know, they they did the deal with Reagan, not Carter, mm. in the nineteen late in seventy nine eighty to get the hostages out of Tehran. And so Johnson can't deliver the peace in Vietnam, <clears throat> and essentially his presidency therefore ends. Um, is set in defeat, and because his vice president is defeated in the in the contest against Richard Nixon, uh, it's seen as a defe- defeat of his his presidency as well as Hubert Humphrey's candidacy. And he dies just before his second term would have ended, which, which is gives, yeah. another great what if of history. I guess yeah. he retires to the to the banks of the um, Pedernales River in Austin, where he grew up and where he now has his big ranch. Um, creates the there's the Johnson Library in um, Austin, which I've been to, which is definitely worth a visit. It, uh, Austin, generally, by the way, is de- definitely a, a, if you're if you like things American, Austin's a great city to visit. And yes, and he dies uh, with the kind of sense, you know, by then America- he's only sixty four as well. He's only sixty four. I mean, of course, you know, he's a kind of heavy smoker, drinker, kind of hasn't had a healthy lifestyle at all. He. Um, but I, I wouldn't think that was too unusual of men of that era, actually. I think, you know, a lot of men did die in their 60s. It's more unusual now. Um, but he... Um, and it kind of feels almost, even though it's only four years later, it's like the world's moving on. Yeah. <clears throat> but... Um, and I think Johnson, because of Vietnam, is sort of essentially forgotten, partly because also he's sandwiched between Kennedy and the dr- terrible assassination and Nixon and Watergate. You know, Johnson people forget about, but he actually came comes back into fashion when, when people find it increasingly hard to get things done. That's why he's you know Joe Biden cited LBJ as a hero of his mm. and he wanted to emulate. When Barack Obama passed uh, you know his Affordable Health Care Act, he was he cited the Great Society, and I think the Vietnam issues, which we remember about containing communist China, fundamentally at the time. You know, who knows? They may be coming right back into centre stage in uh, in global politics. It's very interesting when you think: Can you evaluate Richard Nixon's presidency if you just put Watergate to one side? Can you evaluate LBJ's presidency if you put Vietnam to one side? Well, the answer is no on on both counts. But if Vietnam hadn't happened, he would have gone down in history, I guess, as one of the greatest presidents. Yes, I think so. Certainly, I mean, he's the, as a complete hero of the liberal left. I think. Well, liberal left in an American, you know, sense. Mm. Uh, he, he's. Um, I th- I think that's right. I think the problem and again, there are some parallels with the Labour Party and Tony Blair, and you know, the domestic achievements for the left in in Britain when were, could never outweigh the Iraq War. Yeah. And and it kind of consumed. You know, I saw it tear the left apart <clears throat> here, and I think on a much bigger scale, and the loss of life was sadly even greater in vietnam it kind of destroys the democrat party but johnson sets up the future of politics for america because there's been a huge expansion of the federal government which for all the talk of the reagans of this world has never and george bush's and so on has never been rolled back no one is going to fight the next presidential election saying they're going to get rid of medicare or medicaid Mm. um so he expands federal government into all areas of national life um, and as I was saying earlier, he, he unlocks the door to four subsequent Southern presidents and, and arguably unlocks the kind of economic regeneration of the South. And of course, you know, the civil rights laws he passes for all the problems that have subsequently happened, you know, the fact that Georgia ends up voting Democrat again and that a majority, you know, there's an a African-American black majority in Georgia is because Johnson gave them mm. the vote. Uh, And so he sets in train a whole set of forces in American politics that still shape it today. So in the chart of 46 presidents, where do do you (laughs) place him? Well, all I know is that when you asked me who would I like to write about, I thought Johnson (laughs) came number one. So, um, 
Uh, you know, he's I, he's not he's not. I don't think he's a sort of great president like FDR, Lincoln. I mean, Lincoln. I know it's a bit trite to say Lincoln, but Lincoln. When you read and study what Lincoln had to deal yeah. with, and you know, basically his country falling apart in civil war. You know, Lincoln's a great president. Washington's a great president for, by the way, deciding he's only going to run for two terms. He's going to hand over power peacefully to a successor. Uh, FDR, both in the New Deal and the Second World War. And Reagan, you know, my childhood, kind of gave America back its self-confidence. Um, <clears throat> Johnson's not not in the kind of first, well, first rank, but second rank. Well, I think there'll be a lot of people who, having read your chapter, will be out to buy the Caro biography as if they haven't bought them already. George, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for joining us on the podcast. Join us again next time. Goodbye. <laughs>